side and get everything done through there, putting in implants, having full access, getting around nerve safety, and so forth. And that's really what we've done. And so we've reduced major spine surgeries, as I said before, to an outpatient procedure. Ultimately, our entire focus as a company is to make sure that we've changed spine surgery and allow people to get their lives back, no matter what it is that they want to do. One of our more famous patients, we've got quite a few celebrities, is a guy by the name of Nate the Rock Quarry. And he had uh, blown out his back, had our surgery done, and went back and fought five more times. Uh, his face doesn't look so good, but his back is in great shape. So from a biomechanical perspective, it's a complete success. He actually still looks pretty good. But, um, but he was able to go back to a very high level of activity as a result of this procedure. Another guy that you've probably heard of is, is Bill Wall of NBA Hall of Fame, two-time NBA champions, seven feet tall. He was completely debilitated by his back pain. And he will literally tell you that he was nearly suicidal because of the severity of his condition, the fact that he was on such strong pain meds. And just almost three years ago, he had our procedure done, and he's back doing everything that he wanted to do before. He had to leave his broadcasting career, which he did for about 20 years since he retired because of his back. He's now completely active again. And so we're very excited to be able to provide those kinds of outcomes. This is an example of a patient that had chronic back pain for five years and couldn't stand at the podium and make a presentation for longer than five minutes without really starting to wonder how that person was going to get to a chair. This person is actually me. This is my back. And I underwent our technology. And I realize you probably don't know what the heck you're looking at, but what you're looking at here this is the lower, the lower spine, is an implant that's now fused at two levels. This was all done through the side, as well as was this instrumentation placed through very small portals in, in my back. And since I had this procedure done about five years ago, I can run about as fast as I should. No, I can't do that. But I can stand at the podium for longer than you want me to um, and not have any sort of issues whatsoever. So I've gotten my life back in a very big way. Um, and I went, I don't, I can't tell you how many epidural injections I went through in dealing with my problem for five years. Um, and we were going public and I didn't have time to stop and take care of myself. And ultimately got to the point where my friends dragged me into the operating room, my, my surgeon friends, and said, you, you gotta have this stuff. And I couldn't be happier having done. I was a little bit of a coward about it, like everybody else is. I didn't want surgery, even though I knew the outcome was gonna be terrific. But I feel really blessed to have received this technology and know personally how it changes your life and allows you to get back to do the kind of things that you otherwise just are not able to. So what we're really trying to do collectively is to increase the patient access to innovative medical technology. That's what this presentation is about, and keeping innovation in the U.S. so that we don't have to go outside this country um, to, uh, to, to deal with the taxation problems that, that we're uh, dealing with right now. So really what we want to be able to do is to increase productivity of people. And that's what we're able to do with our technology. You heard a little bit about this uh, earlier, but just some things that you may not be aware of is that in the last 20 years, Americans, we've experienced an increase in our life expectancy of more than three years. This has happened because of innovation. This has happened because of our healthcare system. There's been a 16% decrease in mortality rates, 25% decline in elderly disability rates. And the med tech industry has benefited the U.S. economy. So there's 423,000 American jobs, indirectly responsible for 1.5 million jobs. So these are the kind of things that really make a difference. And the reason is because these disease outcomes really are better than ever before. Just speaking specifically to the industry that we work in, in terms of spine, as I mentioned before, once stigmatized are really bad results, the results are outstanding now. And that's because of innovation. There's no other explanation for it. And it's happened over the course of a decade. So a lot of advancements, um, a lot of opportunities to provide care for people that really were in a hopeless situation. I'm going to show you a photograph of a little girl. This is a little girl. Look at that x-ray. You don't have to read x-rays. That looks like a serpent. That's your x-ray. Now, all you really have to know about x-rays is that it's supposed to be straight. I met this little girl in Kenya. She lives in Nairobi. And she is so much over, as you can see, and she was going to die over the next few years, just really through a suffocation process because of the collapse of her spine 
would cause her not to be able to breathe. And that's what she was going through. And she underwent our procedure. We actually brought her over to the U.S. and made sure that she got the best treatment. It happened at Peyton Manning Hospital. They were very generous. We provided the equipment to our foundation and so forth. But this kid, as an illustration of what the technology can do, no longer has a horrific image and a horrific life, but is now smiling and 10 inches tall. And to see this child walking down the hallway now with a, a little spring in her step versus, versus a, a left and a, you know, saying it bluntly, Quasimodo type of profile is, is remarkable. And it's important to appreciate what we're able to accomplish. Now there's obstacles relative to FDA hurdles right now that we're dealing with. There's obstacles relative to taxation. Specifically, there's a limit on the access that patients are getting to new technology, and that's really what we're seeing. Um, and specifically, if you take a look at what's happening outside the United States, in a lot of cases, medical devices are available anywhere from two years to six years earlier to patients in Europe than they are in the U.S. Not because of safety and efficacy issues, because of bureaucracy. I can tell you firsthand, in terms of our company, we've done three major clinical trials. We still can't get those products on the market. There's not safety and efficacy issues. It's, it's all just basically bogged down in bureaucracy. So now as a company, we will not invest in that area until we can see clarity, until we're certain that we can spend five years or six years getting the device through, but not 10 years plus without any clear endpoints. And so those are the kind of decisions that are being made at uh, corporate headquarters relative to what to do. And that's not good for us in this country, it's certainly not good globally, because what happens ultimately is that these products don't make it to market. You'll probably hear a little bit about this uh, from, uh, from Matt as well, but you know, venture capital is not investing in U.S. med tech right now if it entails doing clinical trials. They won't do it. They're going to go abroad. We're having to do the same thing as a company to do clinical trials in Europe or in the asia pac areas of the world. Same problem. Because of the, I'm sure you've heard this, but the moving goalposts, the, the constant shifting around of what's being required. Now, there's also been some progress made, and we're enthused about the fact that there's a number of things that have happened with regard to reforming what's happening at FDA. But it's, the proof is still in the pudding. It has not translated over into our strategic planning process as of yet. So ultimately, what starts to happen is it slows down jobs. And I can tell you firsthand, that what happens to a company like ours next year, when you've all heard about the medical device tax and are familiar with it, next year for us, that will correlate to about a $14 million hit to the bottom line. That means 200 jobs that we will not be hiring next year. It's, it's plain and simple. Right now, because we're not exactly sure of how severe this may be, and we have, we're seeing a contraction in our space as well, we're putting forward a hiring freeze until we can sort out where we can go. So this year we were going to hire 400 people. We hired 200 people. These aren't, you know, make-believe numbers. These are the things that you just sort of read about and, and flip the page. This has happened. These are people that are being turned away from our human resources department that we cannot hire at a time that we're trying to spur the economy onto a higher level, and especially with people that are highly qualified in terms of their technical expertise and command higher salaries. So we're very concerned about what we're seeing relative to med tech innovation, as well as just corporate tax structure overall. So corporate tax structure, in terms of what's happening for us, we're paying about a 60% total corporate tax right now. We are profitable. That's federal, that's state, that includes some other things that, that uh, relate to acquisitions that we've done over the course of the, year, of the years. But it's a 60% tax. And so for us, because we have pressure as a public company, Form with earnings per share growth, right, as every company does, and increased profitability to some level, we have to figure out other ways to be profitable because that and effectively just means going outside the United States, starting to manufacture in other areas, uh, and to do, to do really what's happening in other areas like China, India, and, and Brazil. So I think I already covered some of these things, but right now 90% of our products are manufactured in the United States. We feel that to some degree we're going to be penalized as being a purely American company and having, having to move things offshore um, and have to do clinical trials as well as manufacturing in other parts of the world, really because of our policies, because of our regulatory environment and policies. 
So I'll keep moving here just to keep things moving at a, at a good pace. But um, so what, what's really happening is that, that we're seeing already right now, I, I think a lot of people have obviously spent time talking about, well, the benefits of, of Obamacare, as, as, as it's referred to, is that there's 30 million more patients that are working their way into the system. Well, that, I guess that depends where, but in our case, that's not the case at all. Because the patients, for the most part, that we treat, the sweet spot is more around 50 years old. Those people are, for the most part, sure, or they're old. So most of this comes through degenerative conditions. So we're not going to see anything near 30 million or any piece of 30 million of, of, of additional patients. What we have seen is we've seen over the course of the last two years a constriction. And what that means is that our market segment has actually reduced about 10%. And what payers have been doing, the insurance companies have been doing, is they've been doling out care at a very slow pace. So you can have debilitating back pain, you can have a very serious condition, and you'll have to negotiate with your payer between the surgeon and the payer to get the surgery done. What used to take a week now can take three months or four months. Or, not at all, just continue on through a, effectively a repeal process. These are, these are big problems that we're faced with overall, and at least specific to spine, and I, I know that it's happening in some of the other areas as well. Probably what's most disturbing about that is that you have insurance companies inserting themselves between the surgeon and the patient. And so what starts to happen is that instead of you making a decision as a patient of what is going to be done to your back, for example, now it's really the insurance company says, well, no, you shouldn't have that procedure. You should have something else done. Well, how does somebody, and a lot of times, it's somebody that's opining from some other state, is telling you via, via telephonic contact what to do to your back. It doesn't make any sense. So these are the practical things that are happening now. This isn't what's going to happen next year. This is happening today. This is underway. And so what's really important to appreciate is that there's other things in the works, uh, like Corey, which really is potentially going to be deciding on which procedures are done period, right? And it's all evidence-based stuff, and that, that's certainly important, but this is being done in such a manner that we have a lot of concern relative to, to that process and, and how it needs to be addressed. So, again, I'm, I want to make sure that I have enough time, so I want to close out here quickly and just tell you that the medical device excise tax for us is truly a big issue. It really means having fewer jobs moving forward. Um, as I mentioned to you before, for me, you know, it, it, it wasn't fun to see the email leaving HR last week saying we, we have to hire freeze because we don't know what's going to happen here. We don't know if this is going to go into effect in January. We know that it's going to be pretty severe. So we need to figure out how to redo our budgets. We don't know exactly where we're going to end up in terms of our OUS uh, initiatives that, that are currently underway. And really that means the things that I've talked about in terms of R&D and so forth, starting to, to leave the U.S. So we need to have some corporate tax reform um, over the, the next, uh, you know, relatively short period of time so that we can ultimately, as a company, continue to bring forward the kind of products that get the kids back up and moving and, and out of those horrific, you know, photos that you saw of a child, or Bill Wong back to work, or wherever it may be, or me, uh, or you, or whoever it is, to get us back and, and contributing to society. And to do that, though, faster, better, and cheaper. So I thank you for listening. I appreciate your attention. OK, good afternoon. Wanted to thank everybody for attending today and giving me the opportunity to, to present. First, I'd like to start off with a quick overview of myself and, and my firm, give a little background. I've been a senior medical advice analyst at Roth Capital since 2006. I've followed the industry now for almost uh, a decade, and although I work in the financial services industry, uh, my true passion remains with medicine. I come from a family of medical professionals with a father who's a surgeon, my mother's a nurse, and, and a nurse, and so on. Uh, and I worked in hospitals throughout uh, my education. Um, over the years, I've, I've really enjoyed the ability to look at a lot of these new products and, and assess whether or not they'll be successful within uh, the structure of a business. Rob Capital Partners is a broker-dealer uh, based on the West Coast, uh, focusing primarily on smaller-sized companies. 
typically under about two billion in, in market cap. Uh, since 2003, we've raised uh, over 15 million dollars for these companies, helping to fuel many of their plans for for growth and, and job creation. So we'll start today with a State of the Union address on the medtech industry, discussing how the industry contributes positively to the healthcare system and the U.S. economy, uh, despite a number of challenges it's currently facing. We'll also look at the medical device tax that is embedded in the Affordable Care Act and show why the rationale for that tax might be more questionable than we originally assumed. And finally, we'll evaluate the additional negative effect medical device tax will have on the industry's financial health, jobs, and innovation. So first, why tech medtech matters. The medtech industry ships $136 billion in products, pays over $25 billion in salaries, and has created over 400,000 jobs. These numbers are impressive on the surface, but uh, in an effort to put them into context, we look at some other stats about the impact of the industry. One study showed that Medical technology improved patient outcomes, highlighted by decreased death rates and increase in life expectancy, as well as an improvement in disability. It's that last item that I think is probably the most important, economically speaking, as an analysis case, getting people back to, to work. Uh, in addition, these benefits have been achieved cost effectively, with a separate study suggesting prices grew slower for medical technology than the CPI. Um, and represented a, a, a consistent percent of uh, national healthcare expenditures. The medtech industry is primarily comprised of small companies. Uh, most of them are uh, have fewer than 50 employees, 80% have less than 50, and surprisingly many, 98% have less than 500 employees. And finally, a state-by-state -state study showed that medtech jobs increase employment, sales, and sales, but in, and earnings by a significant amount in each state. So despite this, the medtech industry has been facing some headwinds recently. The regulatory environment has been unpredictable. And one survey showed that more than half the companies cited the regulatory issue as the biggest challenge to running their businesses today. You can see in the chart that over the past decade, the number of FDA clearances has been steadily on the decline, perhaps a quantitative indication of this issue. Although I point out there appears to be some headway being made on the regulatory front. Secondly, reimbursement is facing pressure across the board. It continues to have a high level of uncertainty for new products. And finally, in the past few years, companies have seen a distinct change in their existing businesses as hospitals have slowed down on both volume and pricing. So to try to put some numbers around those three issues, we look at the pace of investment, particularly venture capital investment. Uh, that's been down from historical levels. Uh, I point out that IPOs, in the last couple of years have been virtually non-existent for the industry, um, which is another indicator of health overall. Uh, and we've come across some data that suggests early stage funding or first round funding for new ideas um, is expected to continue to climb this year. So that's the state of affairs leading into to next year. Today, the biggest topic of conversation surrounds ACA. Uh, just to quickly summarize what you know, um, there's a 2.3% excise tax on all device sales in the U.S. beginning next year. We point out that most of these patients won't enter the system until 2014, and the industry is still awaiting final guidance on how the tax will be collected. It appears the primary justification for this tax is that the windfall derived from newly insured patients under ACA should bring more volume and therefore more revenue to medical device companies. In this section, however, we argue that perhaps the assumption of a windfall as a justification for the tax might not prove as straightforward as previously thought once we take a deeper look into its rationale. Specifically, our analysis suggests that the newly insured under ACA will not fit the profile of the most common medical device users. Hospital purchasing behaviors appears to be less favorable for device manufacturers. And we look at what happened to the medical device businesses in Massachusetts as universal health care was implemented there since 2006. I thought it would first be helpful to define what a windfall is. Winning the lottery is a classic example of a windfall, basically a significant benefit that someone comes across without much effort. The gentleman in this cartoon believes he's coming to a windfall by winning the lotto, but as he is realizing, as he shows his boss his true opinion, his supposed windfall appears to be becoming his downfall. This might be an analogy for the medtech industry, which is better beginning to better understand the effects of ACA 
And on this note, I'd point out that it has been difficult to evaluate the general financial effects of ACA um, as we see financial estimates from the CBO continue to, to change. Bringing this concept back to the medical device industry, our work suggests that the windfall argument as a justification might not prove as straightforward as originally thought. To evaluate this further, we looked at five uh, typical medical devices and the average age of the recipients of those devices. As you, as you can see, they're well into their 60s and 70s, so even younger than Alice's example, or excuse me, older than Alice, Alice's example. If we look at the uninsured today, you'll see that 80% are under 45 years old and 88% are under 55, uh, well below the average device user that we see on the left side of this page. Uh, and looking at the other side, only 2% of the uninsured are over 65 years old. In addition to demographics, we wanted to also see how the primary customer of medical device companies, that is the hospital, uh, how they're faring and how their purchasing behavior is expected to change upon the implementation of ACA. I already mentioned that purchasing behavior has, has weakened, uh, but to put some numbers around this, in the past few weeks we've surveyed uh, 13 companies represent a little over 14 and a half billion of industry revenue and you can see that no one expects the business to get better from that perspective. Um, in fact, over three quarters expect it to be worse. So bringing this back to the, the windfall discussion, one, one conclusion asks that if a medical device customer wasn't expecting to see a, a better environment, um, why should a company expect a windfall is forthcoming? In our final component of the windfall discussion, I'll present some data that we've gathered only over the past few weeks. So this is a very fresh look at a concept that has been discussed in the past but never quantified on an aggregate basis as far as I know. As we all know, Massachusetts implemented a universal health care plan that was legislated in 2006 and implemented over the next few years through 2011. Considering again the premise for the tax, we thought it would be fitting to use them as a proxy for what effect universal health care might have on a national basis. Again, if one were to anticipate a windfall, we should see an improvement in business in Massachusetts. However, the initial data we saw overwhelmingly paints the opposite picture. You can see here that eight out of nine companies saw negative compared to growth rates in Massachusetts as compared to the rest of the US following the implementation of universal health care in that state. In fact, there was only one positive, clearly suggesting that activity did not really improve on the aggregate. This is a small study, um, but again, it was executed only in the past couple of weeks, so I think uh, at least it started in, in, in looking more seriously at this data. So with our interest peaked, we decided to look at some of these businesses in more detail. This slide shows trends for businesses in Massachusetts versus the rest of the U.S. In these six studies, no one showed an improvement in Massachusetts, no one showed a faster growth rate in Massachusetts as compared to the rest of the U.S., Massachusetts being the bar on the left, Massachusetts, the rest of the U.S. being the bar on the right. And in an effort to remove any possible geographic discrepancies in this study, we evaluated three companies' businesses um, with a five-seat kind of control group, um, which are all northeastern states, and again found a similar trend. So the Massachusetts growth rate on the left, the five-state control group in the middle, and then the aggregate U.S. number on the right. And then finally, we see trends for some of these companies over time. You see a reduction in the percentage of sales coming out of Massachusetts, another way to, to look at the data uh, on a consecutive basis. And then we look at a specific procedure uh, for cutaneous coronary interventions, which typically involve angioplasty or stenting. Uh, and this approach showed again that volumes being in Massachusetts being the lighter color line um, actually came down, again suggesting there was no windfall in volume experience there with universal health care. So that was a look at the justification for the tax. And now looking ahead, we evaluate the tax, uh, again slated to, to be initiated here in a couple months' time, how that will affect the, the industry financially. In a recent survey, over 70% of companies indicated that this will have a, a somewhat a very negative impact on their businesses. This next slide summarizes a report we published a few months ago, really in an attempt to portray what seems like a relatively small number in 2.3% of sales and look at it as a percentage of profit. In particular, I highlight these smaller companies taking the biggest hit by far, um, almost nine times the hit to profits that the uh, large company, large cap group, is going to see. And of all the 14 companies on the, in the large cap group, 
All of them had less than a 10% decline in their profits. We look at 22 small cap companies, only one had less than a 10% decline, so it's a pretty consistent basis. And then finally, we look at R&D as a measure or a proxy for innovation. And again, you can see looking at the tax as a percentage of R&D budgets, which is often the most flexible spending line, uh, again, takes a disproportionate hit for smaller groups, and it's a generally bigger hit uh, overall. So that's what it means financially speaking. In layman's terms, these financial pressures bring about changes to jobs and innovation. The med tech industry is one of fierce competition and many times disagreement, but this is one issue where feedback has been remarkably consistent. We pull out a couple of key phrases here to paint the picture. Stryker, 5% workforce reduction or approximately 1,000 people. Cook, postponed plans for new facilities that typically employ three to 400 people. Covidian, laying off 200 workers with plans for offshore production. Zimmer's laying off 450 employees. Boston Scientific built a R&D facility in Ireland instead of the U.S. Hillron's laying off 200 workers with 3% of its uh, workforce, and Nuvasiv's cutting R&D investments um, and freezing hires, as we just heard. So that gives you a, a taste of the actions that are already being taken as a result of the tax. Here's a bigger study of 181 companies uh, that showed a tendency toward job cuts. I'd say this was probably executed maybe a year ago, so we did our own piece over the last few weeks to get some more real-time feedback on this topic. And as you can see here, when we asked companies either if they were cutting jobs or holding back on hiring, or more than half or about half said they're actively cutting, uh, almost 80% are going to hold back on hiring going forward, uh, and more than 80% answered yes to one or the other, meaning they're either cutting jobs or going to freeze hiring uh, into next year. We asked the same line of questioning as it relates to research and development, uh, and again, another 79% said that they would actually cut current, current rated uh, R&D projects or forego future R&D projects. The last part of the survey surrounds moving overseas, uh, and obviously this has been an issue that uh, has been already transpiring in the medical device industry, but again, you see that this only adds fuel to that fire, and 85% of companies that responded to our survey said that uh, they were in fact going to continue to move overseas. So in conclusion, uh, medical technology provides better patient care and quality of life and does it cost effectively. The medtech industry produces high quality jobs that contribute to local and national economies. Reduced investment it, uh, due to an unpredictable regulatory and reimbursement environment is already underway uh, and have already been hitting the, the medtech industry negatively and we think it's tax to before the only exacerbate this trend. Our initial data evaluating a windfall appears possibly to be unfounded, um, especially our, our study in Massachusetts, uh, which suggests that this is probably uh, an, an issue that we need to pursue further. I think that's probably the most striking conclusion today. There was clearly no windfall demonstrated in Massachusetts upon the implementation of universal health care there. And then finally, if the tax is implemented, it will be a hit directly to U.S. jobs, R&D and innovation, and the quality of patient care. So I thank you very much for your time. I think we'll take questions. So we are going to have just a few minutes for questions. It, you know, if you look at the big picture of why healthcare reform was pushed in the first place, it was to uh, drive healthcare costs down while improving patient care. And this industry is the poster child for that. They are driving costs down all the time and creating life-changing technologies that truly improve patients, yet the tax uh, is going to penalize them in a way that is detrimental for innovation, job creation, and the uh, initial analysis as to why the tax was justified now appears to be inequitable. And then we are in this room, in the Senate Finance Committee room, uh, because this is the place where we deal with tax issues, and Senator Hatch uh, has a bill, S-17, to repeal the tax, and we uh, encourage leadership uh, on both sides to consider how do we move uh, that kind of bill to the floor, have to vote, um, so we can start letting these companies have the certainty to know that this tax is not going to hurt them, and they are going to be able to, to uh, build uh, new facilities, grow company, grow jobs, and help companies. So now um, we have a few minutes. If anyone has questions, uh, we're all happy to um, answer. Any questions you have? Okay. Neil and Kate, a few minutes. 
you were talking about the, what, the experience in Massachusetts. Was it a similar tax in Massachusetts? No, the, the basis for that was that uh, Massachusetts implemented universal health care. And that it would corral more people. Correct. And it would get more people devices. But the, with the premise that the basis for the device tax was, was, was that there would be a windfall of new business, new patients for medical device companies. Okay, and, and you, Doctor, um, when, when this law or this particular tax was sort of in the hearings and development stages, what were the answers you were getting back from, say, Obama or HHS people or people who are supporting the Obamacare, what, what were the sort of things they were telling you as you were trying to explain to them the problems? I don't think we've gotten a very clear answer in terms of why. I think that this is one of those things that started off as, you know, a very bad $40 billion idea, and it's become a very bad $20 billion idea, but it's still a bad idea. And there hasn't really been any rationale for, for why, other than, you know, I, I think the, the rationale that came later, which was, well, there's going to be this windfall of 30 million, but you know, we haven't seen that. And, and in fact, our space is constricted, as I mentioned. Um, and, and I think I've heard the same thing from, from other device CEOs that are out of Massachusetts, that they never saw any kind of a windfall um, following the, the changes that took place there. So where you had a windfall that may hit other areas positively, as it relates to the medical device industry, that rationale does not play out as you look at the demographics as, as the, the information showed. And we had another one. I was going to say, Doctor, in terms of your particular, you were talking about spine surgeries, and as that relates to usually more elderly patients, and does your industry not already benefit from a, a government program that provides almost essentially universal health care? for elderly people. That would be my first question. So I agree, the windfall won't necessarily affect your business and your company, specifically because you deal with an older demographic of patients. And additionally, in terms of the tax, were you saying that like research and development, you'll have to put that off uh, into foreign countries, or is also product manufacturing as well? Well, it would be all of those things, because so we, have to cut that. we have to cut across the board, because it's, it's effectively an across the board hit. Right, and so the taxes also on, on anything that's in, any device that's imported in, right? So the only way that the taxes on all U.S. revenue for us, right? Is that so? So I mean, even if you went out source to produce a device and import it in, you would still be applied the two point three percent tax on that product. Yeah. And the only way you'd be exempt from it is if you were to keep the jobs in the manufacturing in the U.S. and export. Well, that means I would have to destroy my business because I'd, I'd lose all my U.S. revenue then to offset it, right? So what we're doing instead is we're now building more OUS revenue for our strategic plan. So instead of it right now for us, about 8% comes from outside the United States, 92% in the U.S., we'll be heavily taxed on that 92%. So our ambition now is, which is by default, is to try to have 20% coming from outside the United States over the next several years to help offset some of that. Then on top of that is to move manufacturing in order to pick up some, some, uh, some, some uh, tax relief, uh, doing clinical trials outside the country and so forth, but it's really moving things into another direction. With regard to your first question, as I mentioned, you know, kind of the sweet spot that starts to happen uh, for spine patients is they usually start deteriorating around age 50. Now, I got bad news for you, but it's going to start at age 50. Um, but and what that means is that it tends to progressively get worse. And so that as you get older, usually you've either had multiple surgeries or you have a much more severe condition. So yeah, there's obviously a Medicare component associated with those surgeries. Um, but but I think the point that I was trying to make is that most of the patients right now for us. Really, it starts off in that 45, 55 sort of age group. And those are the kind of people that you especially want to get back and, and be productive. And as you look at the, the tax, uh, people may think a 2.3% tax is not very much, but because it's on uh, revenue and not an income tax, so that for uh, Nuvasive, where their profitability is going to be in the 30 million or so, their taxes. 14 to 15, that's an effect rate of 50%, not 2.3%. So again, as you look back to the thinking that went into the uh, Affordable Care Act, why this tax 
might have been equitable as you dig deeper both with the windfall and the tax on revenue versus income or profit uh, you look at those justifications don't really bear out as you give it further scrutiny. Another question somewhere? All right, well, thank you very much for coming, and uh, we'll kind of close it up for today. Thank you.